everyone, you are listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast presented by Great Railing. I am Jordan Hall, and as always, I am joined by the dynamic Joe Fordyce, our Flyers pre- and post-game live producer. The 2021 Stanley Cup final is underway. Montreal Canadiens against the defending champs, Tampa Bay Lightning. So, Joe, we thought we would have some fun and look at guys that maybe Flyers fans should be watching for potential targets in free agency. Guys that uh, give them a reason to watch the Stanley Cup if they don't have a rooting interest. Uh, maybe they can watch these players and see guys that the Flyers could approach when free agency rolls around in late July. So, Joe, let's get into that. Canadians and Lightning we will start with the Montreal Canadiens, and we're going to get into a topic with Cole Caulfield later. So, fans that are listening, if you're frustrated that the Flyers passed up on that kid, we'll let you kind of get into your frustrations later. But first, let's look at some pending UFAs or maybe RFAs that the Flyers could be interested in or should be interested in. Joe, we'll start with the Canadians. Any guys on that uh, team that maybe piqued your interest? Well, when you look at the Canadians, the, the, U, the guys with UFA or pending UFA next to their names, I, I don't know how many of them really fit with the Flyers because you have guys like Yoel Armia and Philip Deneau, and those guys – while they would be great to add to the depth of your forwards, those guys are going to cost too much for the Flyers to really be in the mix for them. Um, you know, when you look at the, the guys, the, the ones that stand out for you for Montreal are those RFAs, um, and particularly Jesperi Jess, Kakinemi. Now, Canadians are not going to let him go. He's 20 years old. He's already got multiple years of playoff experience under his belt. He's going to be playing in a Stanley Cup final. I think he's a cornerstone of their future. Um, I mean, there's a reason the kid was barely 18 years old and he was already in the NHL. So uh, I, don't, I think that would be a pipe dream to have any chance of uh, having somebody like him. So, you know, I'm not – I don't lo- – like, there's some veterans out there uh, for Montreal. Like, Eric Stahl is a uh, is unrestricted, and uh, I'm blanking on another guy. There's another veteran. Let's see here. Oh, it's Corey Perry. I'm um, Corey yeah, Perry. There you go. A winning pedigree, but he, he's an aging veteran. He's 36 years old. Yeah. And I just don't know that that's something that the Flyers – I don't – know that's something the Flyers are looking to bring in. Plus, if you bring a guy like a Perry or a Stahl in, what is their role with this current Flyer team? And maybe even more importantly, does it stunt the growth of some of the younger guys that you are trying to grow into certain roles? I think that's the biggest thing because I think they've made that mistake in the past. Yeah, and if uh, I'm with you, Joe. I I don't think there's a ton of Canadians that – you know, that have a pending UFA status or pending RFA status that really make a ton of sense for the Flyers. Uh, but Yoel Armia, of course, I think is an attractive player in terms of uh, I don't think he's going to cost a crazy high amount. And um, he's not coming off the best season. But a uh, talented young player, I think he's a former first-round pick. And uh, he had a really good playoff series against the Flyers last year. I think a lot of people remember him. I don't think Flyers fans will forget him. Uh, he had a good playoff series against the Flyers last year in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Um, that was the last time the Canadians have lost in the playoffs. The Flyers are the last team to, to actually force them out of the playoffs um, as they've made this crazy run to the Stanley Cup final. Uh, so I'm with you, Joe. I don't see a ton of Canadians. Uh, Armia would probably be the one for me. Just I like his age. Um, I like his ability. And I don't think the price tag will be crazy high. Um, but as for if the Flyers are really going to be interested in as do I know about the Canadians and how, how much they want to resign him, I'm not sure. I'd imagine they do. Um, but that would be the one that might stick out in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Armia and Deneau, they're both 28 years old. And one guy I forgot to mention is Thomas Tatar, who yeah. was a big pickup for them last year. Um, he's 30, but his price tag is definitely going to be way too high. So um, I, I just don't see a ton there. And then, you know, you drift down into the t- defense and you see Eric Gustafson. And I don't think that's a guy the Flyers, any Flyers fan wants to see uh, anytime soon, um, though he has played well for this Montreal team. But, you know, we know how that goes. Guys leave here and then they, uh, and then they, they play pivotal roles on teams that win, and it's really unexplained. And when we get into the Lightning, there's another guy on that team that fit into that same category. 
Yep, I think I think a lot of Flyers fans know who that name is, and we can even touch on him later. I know it's, you know, Eric Gustafson. It's I think it's actually impressive that he's actually in the lineup. I didn't think when he went there, I really figured he'd be a healthy scratch for the most of the regular season. And if they went to the playoffs, I figured he'd be a healthy scratch. But he's found his way into the lineup. He's hardly playing. He's playing. But he's had like mul- like he's had a multitude of single digit minute games, which as we know for a defenseman that doesn't happen very often. So he's not playing a whole lot. He's, he's, you know, he's getting power play time, which is what we expected. He's a great power play quarterback. He's a guy that has a ton of skill there, but severely lacks in the defensive end. But the fact that he's playing and you see him randomly on your television screen, you see him sometimes celebrating. I believe he scored a goal. Um, I'm not sure which series, but he had a goal. And I remember a lot of people were like, Holy, you know, Wow. I believe I believe earlier in the playoffs, Petri got hurt, one of their mainstays on yeah. D, and Gustafson played more. And I think that was when he scored. Yeah. Um, but you know, you mentioned he he's has low minute totals, but it's kind of one of those things where when the Flyers get rid of a guy and they end up in the playoffs, even if they're not playing, it seems like you could walk by the TV and you're like, you just you're you're gonna catch that guy's name and you're gonna like, Oh yeah, he's there. Exactly. And I feel like Gustafson's that guy this year because I feel there's been a number of occasions where I almost forgot that he was there. And then you're like, okay, Montreal's on a run, which, you know, a lot of people didn't expect in the first place. And that means Gustafson's there. So who would have thought, you know, back at the beginning of this season when we saw kind of how things were, you know, Gustafson a healthy scratch on the semi-regular for the Flyers, and this guy ends up in the Stanley Cup final. Yeah, kind of weird how things uh, transpire. Really? And I think when the Flyers traded him at the deadline, that was expected. He was a pending UFA. He was here on a one-year deal. He was literally – he was a healthy scratch uh, when the Flyers moved him at the trade deadline. He just didn't have a fit here, and the Flyers obviously were selling parts. And when it happened, it was such a – you know, there was – it was so anticlimactic. It was kind of expected. They got very little for him, got a seventh-round pick, uh, and they even retained, I believe, 50% of his salary. Uh, to, to move him and uh, so you get something for him but if someone told me on the day of that trade that hey by the way Eric Gustafson is going to be playing in the Stanley Cup final with the Canadians I, I would have left so just weird how it works out but I don't think the Flyers obviously are too upset about it it, it is what it is he's he's playing little minutes he had no future here um, it, the signing was a, a failed signing uh, case in point but um yeah, Armia had a nice uh, – and when going back to Armia for a second, Joe, he had a, yeah, he had a nice playoff against the Flyers. He had five points in those six games on the first round last year against the Flyers. Uh, three goals. He was a plus five. He was an impressive player. He was constantly active, constantly making things happen. He had the Flyers on their heels a lot. Um, so he would be a guy maybe maybe the Flyers peek in on. Um, but, again, I don't really know where his status is in Montreal. If the, if the organization really wants him back, I imagine they do. He's, like you said, he's younger and he's – and he's not very expensive right now. So, but we shall see. Uh, Joe, shifting gears, looking at the Tampa Bay Lightning, the defending champs, obviously the favorites in this series, um, a team that's uh, definitely in win now mode. They were in win now mode last year. Here they are again. They're going to have some UFAs and some guys available that they probably can't retain all of them, as we know. Uh, any UFAs or names on the Tampa Bay Light- Lightning roster that Flyers fans should keep an eye on? Well, I'll tell you what, at the trade deadline this year, the Lightning felt like they needed some veteran help on defense, and they went and got David Savard. David Savard's a UFA. If a, if a team coming off a Stanley Cup and with aspirations of winning back-to-back Stanley Cups um, is looking at a guy like David Savard, I'm looking at a guy like David Savard if I'm the Flyers because the Flyers clearly they need to go out and make a splash on the blue line. And I'm not saying David Savard's the, the guy like to go get to be your number one. But what I'm saying is David Savard, maybe in your second pair, you know, down your lineup a little bit. This is a valuable player to have a lot of experience. Um, he's a veteran. And I really think he would help your de- help the depth uh, on this team. And like I said, I mean, if a team that looks is looking at, winning back-to-back Stanley Cups potentially is adding him to their roster to bolster their blue line. I'll take a shot on him too. He's a UFA. He was clearly a rental for this, uh, at this trade, this past trade deadline for Tampa to make another run here. And here they are in the Stanley Cup final. Um, I guess there's always a chance Tampa would try to re-sign him, 
they got a lot of big numbers on that on that um, roster though, and um, they didn't have Kucherov on their cap this year, so that's always a big thing. I think they're going to be in a little bit of a nightmarish cap situation, you know, with coming back next season with Kucherov healthy and having to count him against their cap. Um, I wouldn't want to be a UFA on the Tampa Bay Lightning because I don't know if there's any of those guys on that list that they're going to be bringing back. Yeah, no, truly. Uh, they're definitely, like you, like we mentioned, in win-now mode because uh, their team will definitely change next year. Um, yeah, Savara, Joe, if I remember, he was a pretty popular name around the trade deadline when the Flyers were still in the playoff picture and they were talking a lot about adding a defenseman. I remember Savara was a popular name along with Matias Ekholm. Um, obviously, that all changed and fizzled as the Flyers' season fizzled. Um, yeah, a guy for me, and I, I, we've spoke about him, uh, spoken about him on a previous podcast, was Blake Coleman. I really like Blake Coleman. I just think he's a really good winger, complimentary guy, but can also score goals. He's got a couple 20-goal seasons. And I just think he would – I say this a lot, but I think the Flyers were what Sean Couturier said. They were too easy to play against at times throughout this season – they gave up the most goals in hockey. I think that's a uh, perfect example of them, them being too easy to play against. I, I think Blake Coleman would give them some nice offensive contributions, but he would really make them tougher to play against. Um, so that's a guy I, I like, and he, he's making uh, only $1.8 million currently on his deal. He'll be a UFA in the offseason. I think he'll have a lot of suitors. He's up for a payday, but I think he'll be reasonably priced. I don't think he's going to – um, take the roof off on the market. So uh, Blake Coleman's a guy I just think would be a really good fit. He's still only 29. Um, just a guy that I think can do a lot for this team. Uh, and a kind of an under-the-radar guy. I know everyone's thinking defenseman, defenseman, defenseman with the Flyers, but I think they can defend and play better throughout the length of the rink. Uh, and that goes for forwards, and that goes for defensemen as well. I think Blake Coleman will be a nice addition. So that's a guy I think Flyers fans, hey, watch him, see what you think. Uh, he's going to be a guy that's going to be a pretty popular name out there. And I, I wouldn't um, hate it if the Flyers looked into his services. That's a guy for me. And the, the thing that stands out about Coleman, Jordan, is that he can play both wings. Yeah. He's played both sides. So he has that, you know, versatility to him. And, and the Lightning are one of those teams where when you, we've watched them over the last few years, of course they, they had the upset in the first round a few years back, but you know, they, they, were able to come back and win their cup and kind of make good on that situation. But they're one of those teams where guys just kind of like come out of the woodwork and they, yeah. you know, you're like Chernak, for example, one series Chernak gets on a hot streak. The next series, it might be Tyler Johnson. And, you know, the next series, it's another, they always have these guys coming out of the woodwork and Blake Coleman is one of those guys. So I do agree. He would be maybe the most attractive on there. I mean, I think he and Savard are, yeah. are definitely guys to keep your eye on um, from these two teams. Um, and I, I, don't, I think both of those guys are going to end up on the market because of the, the previously mentioned cap situation with Tampa after this season. So, yeah, definitely those two guys are guys to keep your eye on. Yeah, I agree, Joe. I think those two guys, Savard and Coleman, are two guys that Tampa Bay is just going to have to bite the bullet and say, hey, you know, like they, they are role players on a very good team. And they might have to say, hey, thank you for your services, but, uh, you know, go ahead and hit the market. We need to move on here because we all know about Tampa's cap issues and how tricky that will be for them going into next season. And, yeah, Coleman just had a, he had a really good playoff with Tampa last year. Obviously, Tampa Bay acquired him uh, from the Devils. Uh, in 25 games, as Tampa went on, went on to win the Stanley Cup, 25 games, he had five goals, eight assists. He was a plus six, had 126 hits, um, played almost 18 minutes per game. Just Real rock-solid guy, and I know some people get frustrated with the Flyers constantly loving 200-foot players, but guys that, you know, sometimes when you're 200-feet player – or 200-foot player, excuse me, uh, you're not always the most offensive guy or the most talented guy. But Coleman can score. He can do a lot of things. Uh, he's done – he's put up 20-plus goals uh, twice in his career. Um, so it's not like he's just a tough guy that's, you know, going to make the Flyers uh, defensively sound. He can – he can – score some goals, and like you said, Joe, can play both wings. So, and, it's, and, it's an and he plays for them because of the amount of firepower they have. He's played on their, you know, their bottom six a lot of time for Tampa. So, you know, it's, you're not bringing in a Blake Coleman to come in and score 25 goals. That's not why you signed Blake Coleman. No. If Blake Coleman's the only guy you signed, 
it doesn't matter what you think of him because it's not, that's not good enough. Yeah. So Blake Coleman is a complimentary piece, not a, you know, he's not like your plot prized free agent. But when you, it's just crazy when you think about, um, so you mentioned he scored 20 goals twice in his career and you mentioned his salary was 1.8 million. So Kevin Hayes career high in goals is 25 and, and his salary is seven plus million. So, I mean, yeah. it, you know, you, the good teams, the teams that win the cup, they always find these guys. Yeah. These are the guys they find. Of course, you can go get your big guys and you need your big guys, but you need these guys too. And as I just mentioned, the guys for Tampa that came out of the woodwork last year, they're coming out of the woodwork again this year. And all of a sudden you look up and this guy's got two goals in a game or that guy has two goals in a game. And, you know, it's, it's, I mean, Steve Eiserman built the team. He's now in Detroit, of course, but he built the team and, and he built it the right way. They have a lot of depth and great teams. The teams that win the Stanley cup always have depth yep. and the flyers need it. No, amen to that. And I know some people get frustrated when the Flyers make an acquisition or when you hear that they're interested in a player and you hear, oh, he's a good PKer or something. They're like, oh, great, another PKer. But the Flyers were 30th in penalty kill last year and they were 31st in goals again. So they need help in those areas. And Blake Coleman is a high-level penalty killer. He's a proficient PKer. And, again, we're, we're stating it ad, ad nauseum, but – he can produce offensively too. He's not just like a one-trick pony, just a very well-rounded guy that's playing a role on a Stanley Cup winning team, a team that's trying to win their second in a row. So um, a guy that I just, for a fact, would make the Flyers better. And like you said, Joe, he will not be their prize acquisition. If they go out and get him, they're going to get someone else too. He would just be, if the Flyers go out and they need to go out and get multiple players, they go out and get help this offseason, whether it's via trade or free agency, they will get multiple guys. Coleman would be a nice addition, a good complimentary piece. And you mentioned, too, Jordan, you know, fans getting sick of 200-foot players. Well, the Fly a couple things with that. One, the Flyers needed more 200-foot players last year because of, you know, you just mentioned how many goals they gave up, how many short – or how many power play goals they gave up. Um, and two, not like – getting sick of hearing about 200-foot players is like someone saying – I'm getting sick of hearing about all these shooters on the floor for an NBA team. Yeah. You can't get enough of them. You yeah. can't have enough of it. So go get as many as you can get as far as I'm concerned. Seriously. And you think um, when the Flyers obviously parted ways with guys like Tyler Pitlick and Derek Grant and Nate Thompson, that was fine and well. Um, I, I thought they should have been interested in bringing Tyler Pitlick back. I think they were, but they, they really liked some of their youth in their bottom six, and they wanted to let those guys seize roles that didn't work out real well. Obviously, a lot of some of their younger pieces that they were expecting to kill penalties and do a lot of the things that the Pitlicks and Grants and Thompsons did uh, did not play well. They did not take positive strides. But you think you can just throw a guy out there to kill penalties, but that's just not how it works. Like, guys develop penalty kill pedigrees and track records because they're very good at it, and they're trusted in those roles – and they help teams win games in those roles. And Sean Couturier even hit it. Uh, so did Elaine Vigneault uh, during the, towards the tail end of the season when we were asking him them about the PK. Both of those guys mentioned, well, we lost some guys that were very good at those roles, and we tried putting younger pieces in, pieces that maybe didn't have those track records yet, and they struggled. And that's okay. Like, I think the Flyers are hopeful Philip Myers turns into a very good PKer. Um, and that Nicholas Albe Kubel takes bigger strides there, and other younger pieces can start killing penalties. And it, it takes time, but uh, they were a better team last year in 2019-20 because they had guys with experience in those in those key roles. Um, I don't think it's just a coincidence that the Flyers went from 11th in PK to 30th. Uh, they lost guys, they lost personnel, and it hurt them. Flyers Talk is brought to you by Great Railing. Stop into Great Railing for the highest quality and lowest prices on all your railing, decking, and fencing needs. Well, Joe, let's get into a fun cold brew check that I think will certainly spark debate. We had one on our previous podcast that I think certainly sparked debate. That's what we love about the cold brew check, which is presented by Duncan. Joe, Cole Caulfield is a popular name right now in Philadelphia among Flyers fans because he's having a heck of a playoffs. He had a very good semifinal series. Um, he was all over it. I think Joe, he had four goals, maybe five, four or five, 
four or okay, five goals. I lost track. <laughs> yeah, he was scoring. In one series. <laughs> I know, he was scoring so many goals. I, I know he had, I believe he had four. You know, I'm going to look into it. I think he had, no, you know, he had four goals in the Stanley Cup final, semi, uh, final series because I remember he had three goals going into, I think, that final game, the, the winner for uh, Montreal in game seven, I believe. So that was his fourth. But anyway, long story short, he's having, he had a very good semifinal series, was all over the place. Uh, really was a talk of the league uh, because he was playing so well at 20 years old. As we all know, he went from Wisconsin to the AHL, and now he's in the Stanley Cup final, and he's really making an imprint. A lot of Flyers fans know the team passed on him in the 2019 draft. So did 13 other teams, 14 teams in total, passed on Cole Caulfield. The Flyers got Cam York at 14th overall. Cole Caulfield went the very next pick at 15th overall to Montreal, where he's now playing in the Stanley Cup final. Joe Caulfield had a hell of a draft year. He scored 72 goals, 100 points. Uh, he's a very tiny winger, so he was very polarizing in that draft. Some people thought he would go top five. He ended up going 15. I think a lot of teams maybe doubt, doubted his size translating into the NHL. Would he be able to score goals at that type of clip? Not 72 goals, but would he be able to – have his biggest strength translate with the lack of size. So far, you're seeing his, his strengths translate. But there is still a lot to be said and done in both Cam York's career, Cole Caulfield's career. But does it sting a little bit more? Are you a little more frustrated that the Flyers passed on this kid now that he's having success in the playoffs already at 20 years old? Well, I don't think it's just success in the playoffs. When you look at this, it's and, – and I should say, this is not a knock on Cam York at all. He shows a lot of potential, and it looks to be on the Flyers' blue line for many years to come. However, the night of the draft, that draft, you never want to hear this guy is a pure goal scorer, have him be available and have your team pass on him because you have visions of what is happening right now as we speak. Cole Caulfield was the best player on the ice for Montreal in almost every one of their games that they've played in the last two series. And, you know, the whole thing with, the, with his size, like last time I checked, Mark Recchi wasn't big and he's a Hall of Famer, you know. So sometimes you need the little guys that just score goals. Those guys play for winning teams. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it does sting because, you know, he is – doing this let's just remember he's not only doing this in the playoffs he's doing it in the playoffs for a team that is surprising a lot of people in montreal that is a pressure cooker of all pressure cookers in the playoffs and this kid has not only lived up to expectations i mean he's completely set a whole new set of expectations um and it i mean it's really impressive and I've, I've tweeted this out a couple of times. I tweeted it the other night. I said, you know, no slight to Cam York, but I have a feeling that Flyer fans are going to be having nightmares about Cole Caulfield being available into 2019 draft. And Tyrone Johnson from the Mike Missinelli show is, and, uh, and Sixers Outsiders, he tweeted us back, don't do this to us. And I said, I'm just saying, I'm just saying what's in front of me. And this guy looks like he's a star in the making and you know Montreal and Toronto are the places where guys that have pedigrees go and they wilt and they wilt under the pressure and this guy's doing the exact opposite yeah it's impressive not only does he score four goals in the you know to get Montreal to the Stanley Cup final but he does it against Vegas which was arguably the best team in the NHL right there with the avalanche this season um, and yeah, like you said, in a market like Montreal, where they've been craving, obviously, a, a team to go back to the cup and be a winner again, just a big time market for a kid that's just not scared of the moment. I think that's what a lot of people liked about him is that he, he definitely plays with a moxie. He, he has a con like if you score 72 goals in your draft year, you got to have a moxie, you got to have confidence, something to you that uh, makes you play with an edge. And I know he's been doubted for his size a lot. So maybe that's something that drives him too. But, yeah, he's been impressive. He's been fun to watch. But, Joe, I will say this. You have to give these things time. And the fact is the Canadians went to the playoffs and gave him a chance to play in the playoffs. Um, it's not like Cole Caulfield had this incredible regular season and he won the Calder Trophy and 
Yeah, he only came up at the end of the season. Yeah, so listen, hey, stick taps to the kid for seizing the moment and getting in there and playing the way he is. Like, he's, he's playing with nothing to lose, and that's great for him. He's gonna, and I remember Brent Flair, their assistant GM, Flyers assistant general manager, whoever sees their scouting, we chatted with him when they drafted York, and of course, you know, we asked him about Cole Caulfield. Not only did they pass on him, they passed on him twice because they moved back. They had the 11th pick. They moved back to go to 14, so they could have had him twice, really. And I, I think that's what makes it a little more difficult uh, for the Flyers fans to swallow is that everyone thought when he was still available at 14, they were like, oh, they're going to get him. And then they say out of the U.S. development program, they're thinking, yes, Cole Caulfield. And no, it's Cam York. But you got to give these things time. You have to give these things time. Cam York and Cole Caulfield have combined for 13 regular season games in their NHL career so far. Like, just, you got to give it time. I understand Cole Caulfield looks like he's going to score goals at this level, but you, you still need to see him in a regular season, a full regular season. You got to see him when maybe he's more of the guy for a team. Uh, Kim York, you think, could be a guy, like the guy on your back end alongside Ivan Provorov. He's going to play big minutes. He's going to quarterback your power play. And let's not forget what Cam York accomplished this year. Big Ten Defenseman of the Year, was U.S. captain at the World Juniors and won a gold medal. And he played three games for the Flyers, too. So he got to the NHL as well and showed what he could do, too. So, like, it's so easy to watch the Stanley Cup and see Cole Caulfield score a highlight reel goal and be like, well, there you go. Thanks, Flyers. Like, it's real, it's real easy and cheap for me to, like, say that. Like, get, you got to give it time, in my opinion. Um, don't take away from what Cam York did either. Uh, yes, maybe it stings a little bit. But to me, just have some patience. Let these kids pan out. But give it two, three seasons, four seasons, and then maybe we'll see where those two kids are at. And maybe you can then at that point be like, well, Flyers, you should have taken Cole Caulfield. But to me, or you could just say both know. players are really good. Both things can be true. Right. You and know? I remember <laughs> Brett Flair, when we talked to him, he said, listen, it was nothing against Cole Caulfield. We actually really like the kid. We think he's going to be a player. Um, I had to look back at my story. I remember writing about it the night of that first round. I wrote about why the Flyers took Cam York over Cole Caulfield. And Brent Flair had nothing but bet. Nothing but good things, excuse me, to say about Cole Caulfield. They liked him. They think he's going to be a player and that the size wouldn't really hold him back. They just really liked Cam York. Their entire scouting staff had seen him a ton. Uh, obviously, that made them see Cole Caulfield a ton. So they probably have a good read on it. And they really liked Cam York. And they think he can, he can be on their blue line for a decade plus and play a long time, put up points. He's a fun player, too. So it just, in my, in my, in my opinion, Give it time. Give it time. Enjoy Cole Caulfield. Watch him in the playoffs. Watch him in the Stanley Cup final. Hopefully, uh, for Flyers fans, he doesn't keep putting up goals at this rate because I'm sure that will be uh, tough to see. But I think uh, you just got to be patient here and let these kids play their careers out. But you know what? If the Flyers made the playoffs, maybe people are talking about Cam York this yeah. way. I mean, like you mentioned, Caulfield is get, being afforded the opportunity because Montreal keeps winning series and Montreal made the playoffs. Yeah. And they can tinker with things. We saw three games of Cam York, and the three games, what we saw, we liked. But they were also at the back end of a season that was on a road to nowhere. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if they were playing at this time of year, maybe we'd be talking about, uh, you know, what Cam York projects as next year and the leap that he made and all those sorts of things, too. So, again, both players could be great players. In two, three years from now, we could be saying, man, what a strong draft. Both those players are great. Right. Right. And no, go ahead. I should just mention, too, the, the thing with Montreal, too, right now, is they're on one of these runs where every button they push is, is the right button. Um, Carey Price is playing out of his mind to the point where he could, I, I believe, become the second player. If they were to lose the final, I think he could still win the con Smythe. And I think Ron Hextall is the only guy that's ever done that before. Yeah. So that's one thing. Secondly, their coach, Dominique Ducharme, he has been out of the mix with COVID now for almost three weeks. And former flyer Luke Richardson has taken over as the head coach, and they haven't missed a beat. They, they've even played better, you could say. If you recall last year during the bubble um, – why am I blanking on who the Montreal coach was that had to leave the team? Claude Remember Julian. Claude, Claude Julian and then Kirk Muller had to take over. Yep. And, you know, 
so and it didn't go like this and this is go this is like on the doorstep of the Stanley Cup final you having to make these wholesale coaching changes and Luke Richardson's done an admirable job um he's a great guy he was a really good flyer and I I I would be remiss to not say congratulations to him um the video of him from the last series uh blowing the kiss up to his daughter after his first NHL win as a head coach uh Luke his daughter passed away in 2010 and um that was just a great moment to see um I texted with Luke a little bit ap- uh, about that afterwards and he he told me what a special night it was so yeah. uh feel really good for Luke Richardson and you know that's kind of made me lean toward rooting for the Canadians in this series uh I think I think Ducharme's supposed to be back uh by game three mm-hmm. but nevertheless I mean what an interesting twist and again it seems like every single year we see flyers fingerprints all over like the cup final and the periphery of the cup final we had John Stevens last year with an assistant with Dallas and he was you know right in there on the mix we had Braden Coburn one of the first guys to hoist the cup despite not playing a lot last year um, for the Tampa Bay Lightning last year um, it just seems like every single year you're seeing Flyers DNA around the playoffs. You know, yep. uh, Rod Brindamore, of course, is one of the hottest coaches in the league at this point in time. Yeah. Um, Craig Berube won the cup a few years ago with St. Louis, uh, you know, former Flyers coach. So it, this organization has a lot of history and a lot of good, um, a good foundation to it. And every guy that leaves here, I remember talking to John Stevens last year about it and Braden Coburn. There's, there's just something here. And you just know one of these days, one of these years it's going to pay off for the Flyers themselves as opposed to guys who were once part of this franchise and have, have moved on. Yeah, you certainly hear a lot about Flyers' footprints all the time. Every time the Stanley Cup final rolls around, uh, and as we all know, the Flyers haven't been back there uh, since 2010. And maybe it's tough for Flyers fans to hear that because it's like, well, why are we always talking about Flyers' ties instead of Flyers actually there? Doing it right. Themselves. I mean, the, the two Stanley Cups that the Kings won were Mike Richards and Jeff Carter, yep. Dean Lombardi, a former Flyers, uh, um, and Ron Hextall was part of those as well. Yep. So, you know, you had you had all kinds of Flyers fingerprints all over those. Uh, yep. um, Rick Cockett was an assistant for a pair of cups in Pittsburgh. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. You look around. And maybe you could go around and say that for all the teams. I, you know, you – I haven't studied the lineage of every single team, but all I know is every year I feel like I see, oh, this assistant, he used to be with the Flyers. This guy used to play for the Flyers. And they're always in, you know, in prominent, prominent positions. And, you know, credit to them. Yep. Yeah, and and it shows you how small the hockey world is and sometimes also how, uh, you know, a lot of teams always say to get to the Stanley Cup final, you need breaks, you need luck, um, you need good fortune, all that cliche and fun stuff. but like the, the, that kind of ties it back perfectly to call Caulfield is that Montreal needed a lot of breaks to get where they are. They're play, They're having a great playoffs. I don't want to take anything from what Montreal is doing. Uh, we all saw it when they played the Flyers last year in the first round, they were a really tough out. The Flyers struggled with them. They struggled to score goals against them. Uh, that was a dog fight of a series and everyone could see, and you could see Montreal had a lot of good things going for them in terms of young uh, youngsters. They have a great goalie. Um, they have experience on the back end. Like, they had a lot of ingredients, and you're, you're seeing it. But let's not forget a lot of breaks. Uh, they were in a weaker division this year. Uh, they got in with fewer wins than the Flyers had, fewer wins than a, a handful of teams had that didn't even make the playoffs. So division re- realignment certainly helped them. Um, and then th- what does that do? That sets up Call Caulfield's chance to show what he can do. So, hey, it happened. Some breaks went along the way, and I like Cole Caulfield. I don't want this to sound like I don't like Cole Caulfield. I thought he was a great player. Um, I actually wrote about him as a draft target for the Flyers. Would have loved it if the Flyers got him. But they're both 20 years old. They both played 13 combined regular season games. In my mind, you got to be patient here and let prospects become players before you really um, debate this. And to me, it's one of the cheapest and laziest things in my mind when – you look back at the draft history and you go down and you're like, oh, well, that team could have had that guy. They passed on him. Like hindsight's 2020. Every, every, draft in, every draft in the history of sports, 
and nobody ever does the draft the other way when you nail a pick right. and you and you you see the guy who's not in the league anymore that's picked at the next pick nobody ever says well thank goodness they didn't pick you know this player instead of this superstar that we got and you know you look at you you look at what happened and and you know i i had mentioned this i tweeted it out the other day how fast things can change in an off season and this should give hope to Flyers fans. We saw the Flyers play Montreal in the playoffs last year, and Montreal was overmatched. They gave them a good run, but they were overmatched. So th- look what they did. They go out. They have Josh, they got Josh Anderson, who played a pivotal role for them this year, one of their forwards. But look how their team's built. They're built. Carey Price, outstanding goaltender, number one defenseman in Shea Weber. They, and it all came together, the mixture of young players and veterans, and it's all come together this year for them. Um, so, you know, hope is not lost. You don't need a long rebuild in the NHL. Those days in really all sports seem like they're over. Because, you know, you don't want to sit there and, and, watch, and tell your fan base to wait three, four years for them to be competitive again. It just doesn't work that way. So, you know, teams maneuver. It's the challenge of the GM. And Mark Bergevin's done an unbelievable job with the Montreal Canadiens. And, hey, Carey Price is Carter Hart's idol. So hopefully Carter is taking in what his idol is doing during these playoffs. And, you know, hopefully it'll, some of that will rub off on him going into next season and, you know, forward in his career. That was the cold brew check presented by Duncan. This season, be sure to grab a cold brew for game time because where there's hockey, there's Duncan. Yeah, Joe, things can certainly turn fast in this league. Like you said, just – Lengthy rebuilds don't always happen. They're not always needed. Um, there's a lot of parity in the NHL. We all know that. And, uh, yeah, before you know it, by, like, a flip of the switch, you know, next season, clean slate, things can turn. The Flyers are certainly hoping things turn for them. They need it to after what they went through this season. Uh, they disappointed a lot. They disappointed their fan base. And they need to get back on track next year and be back in the playoff business. And they're hoping Cam York could be a part of that. They're going to want him pushing for a – roster spot in training camp and you're seeing what your youth can do now sometimes you see when you draft a a kid in the first round it takes two three four years sometimes it doesn't and these kids come come up here Cole Caulfield is showing that he's a difference maker already right now for the Canadians and he'll be playing in the Stanley Cup final pretty impressive Cam York the Flyers are hoping is going to be making an impact next year as well so youth vets a good blend and uh, sometimes you're right where you want to be but Joe Forrest this was fun Great chatting with you. I know we'll enjoy the Stanley Cup final, and we'll have plenty more Flyers talk throughout the Stanley Cup final, uh, hitting on all things off-season related and all things Stanley Cup related. But thanks so much, Joe, as always, for joining me. A special thank you to Ben Barry, our podcast producer as well. And Flyers fans, as always, thank you for listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast presented by Great Railing. Wherever you get your podcasts, please rate and listen. Check us out on YouTube as well. And we cannot wait to talk to you next time.